beauty out of its out of its case. My name is Dr. Cutter Calloway. I'm an associate professor of theology and culture here at Fuller Theological Seminary. I'm going to be talking about 1st and 2nd Samuel today and doing so through the perspective of theology and the arts or theology and culture. teenager, my family was pretty poor. And so when I first decided I wanted to play the guitar, um, my my parents didn't really have enough money to buy me one. So I saved up money from mowing lawns, I think it was one summer, and bought my best friend's cheap, old, generic acoustic guitar. I got some some pretty good skills in uh, sort of fretboard work. I, my strumming was, was pretty solid. Um, even my different sort of like fingering patterns for chords was working out well. Um, and I, I thought I was progressing pretty well until uh, I ran into my friend again and he loaned me his tuner. And I tuned my guitar up and was super excited because I'm like, yeah, all right, I'm, I'm really in tune. And as soon as I started playing, instead of it being this like glorious moment where I was playing an in-tuned guitar, the sounds of the guitar were really sort of jarring and, and off-putting to me because my ear had been accustomed to hearing only a guitar that was out of tune. I literally didn't have the ears that could hear what the guitar should sound like. So what does that have to do with First and Second Samuel? Uh, First and Second Samuel tells the story of God's people, of Israel, as they transition from this time in which they're led by prophets and judges uh, into a time in which they're actually led by kings. But that's just the plot, right? That's just sort of the things that happen in the story. What, what these books are really about, I think, is a God who hears. Um, they're also about the people of God struggling to listen and to respond to the voice of God, not simply because they're obstinate or, you know, shutting their, putting their hands over their ears, um, but because they had actually lost the capacity to hear. They had lost the capacity to respond in some sort of collaborative harmony with God and they actually needed new ears. Now, this story in tune starts with Hannah um, and her dedication of her firstborn son uh, to Yahweh and, and dedicating his life to the temple. After she pleads with God to open her womb, she had uh, struggled with infertility in a barren womb, the story tells us. Um, God hears, hears her prayer, and blesses her with a child, and she names that child Samuel, which is actually Shemuel is God has heard. So what's interesting is if you compare Hannah's faithfulness in these early stages of God hearing her plea and her hearing God's response of faithfulness, um, and you compare that to the sons of Eli that open up the, the, the book of 1 Samuel, um, they not only leverage their role as, as priests for their own sort of self-interested gains, but they actually are guilty of, of some intense oppression and violence against women in their midst. Now, Eli, their dad, the priest at the time, knows all about these transgressions, right? Um, and they take place out in the open, in full view of everybody else, and he does nothing. In the face of this horror and the trauma that his own sons are inflicting on people, he chooses to remain silent. The cries of these victims fall on deaf ears because the whole community was spiritually, morally, and economically tone deaf. So given the way First and Second Samuel starts, it's no small wonder that this sort of spiritual deafness um, or the spiritual tone deafness permeates the entire text. Um, whether it's Saul's presumptuousness and, and arrogance, um, all the way down to David's uh, taking of multiple wives and eventually his rape of Bathsheba and impregnation of Bathsheba. And what's particularly shocking about all of this is that David's regarded as the paradigmatic king of Israel. Actually, he's, he's not just a good king or an, an okay king. He is actually a man after God's own heart, we're told. He's even a, a great musician, right? And an author of a number of Psalms. So you would think of all of God's chosen leaders, he surely would be able to respond in harmony and resonance to the voice of God speaking in their midst. The point to me is that even as it concerns King David, 
the narrative first and second Samuel makes something abundantly clear. If only we have the eyes to see it and the ears to hear it. The people of God need to become far better listeners. But that will never happen if we can't hear rightly. If violence and justice and oppression sound to us like peace and prosperity, it's because we're tone deaf and we need new ears. The good news, of course, is that God is a God who hears, Shemuel, and in doing so transforms us into a people who, whose ears are capable of hearing the same soft whisper that woke the young Samuel. Quote, I'm about to do something that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. I wonder if we listen for that voice today, the one that continues to whisper to us through these scriptures, what would we hear? What might God be doing in our midst that would make our senses tingle? And maybe more importantly, are our ears attuned in such a way that we could even hear it?